Well, good morning to you this morning. Good morning. Hey, it's good to see you today, and uh, so thankful that uh, you are here, and we have the opportunity uh, to worship together uh, today. I have a, a couple of announcements, and then we'll get into our prayer list and our uh, reading of Scripture. First thing I want to do, I meant to do this last Sunday, and it just slipped my mind, so, uh, you know, after 72, you can say that and kind of get away with it a little bit, but... Uh, uh, I do want to say thank you. You know, they say when the cat's away, the mouse will play. And I believe a couple of weeks ago, y'all played a little bit when I was gone, had a little business meeting and, and uh, got some things done and, 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 and increased uh, pay to me. And I, I, I don't know how to say thank you enough but for all the things that you do, uh, not only just then, but just all the things that you do uh, for me as your leader. And I, I certainly do appreciate it. And Peg and I just wanted to say a special thank you to you. And uh, I think we got internet uh, now, and that got started last week, and so hopefully that little bit of drag time that, that was out there is getting away. And uh, so we're just like, hey, just good things that happen, and we're grateful for it. And Todd was telling me, sent me a couple of weeks ago, he sent me a text and said, I just thought it might encourage you to know that there are at least six countries that listen to us every Sunday. Isn't that something? <laughs> Little old Olive Branch. Could you imagine that? Portugal and places like that that are logging in and are listening to the Word of God. And so uh, we're grateful that that, that that internet got connected, so hopefully that'll help, uh, help that a little bit uh, along as well. Also, just uh, by, by way of announcement, the, the craft class meets on, on the 5th this week uh, at 10 o'clock, so just a reminder about that. And then also, I, I think a, a group text went out, but I would just make sure that, that more people are, in, are you know, notified other than just that. Southern Care Hospice had asked us if we would uh, be interested in being uh, involved in providing some pound cakes for, to be given out at, for Father's Day for, for them, and so that opportunity is out there. Uh, if, if you're willing to, to bake a, a pound cake and bring it, you can bring it on Thursday by 10 o'clock. Cindy Warren will be here uh, to receive those if that's something that, that you can do or, or if you uh, need uh, some more information about that, you can contact Cindy uh, Warren and uh, she can give you some more information about that. It's a great opportunity to just express love to uh, some folks there. Uh, all right, our prayer list today, I want to want to go over that prayer list with you and some a couple of names that uh, have been given that we can take off the prayer list and some names to add today. But let's go down through our prayer list this morning. Uh, Felix Andrews, Ann Arrington, Rhonda Baggett, Dwight Bennett, uh, Hiram Beasley, Robbie Lyles, Kim Brown, Max Bush, Walter Carrier, Wayne Carrier, and of course, Wayne and Janine both remembering them uh, in, in, in the nursing home from, for some uh, rehab and rehabilitation, uh, primarily for Wayne. And I visited with them this week, but we do need to continue to remember them in prayers. A big thing for him is just strength and getting back going. So just especially pray for Wayne and Janine. Uh, Justin Chandler, Tommy Kendrick, Evan L. Halford, Berlin Finley, John Andrew, Pete Wolf, Cheryl Johnston, Cecilia McCullough, Steve Moon, Brenda Creech, Sheila Brown, Jimmy Cook, Jackie Skipper, Becky Smith, Laura Joyner, Verley Stuckey, Daryl Levi, Fred McIntyre, Bessie Watts, John Woodward, Janice Vickery, Chad Garrett, Randy Higdon, Thomas Fowler, Brenda Wilson, Hank Long, Cora Oswald, Jimmy and Janice Booker, Francis Shadburn, uh, Melanie Johnson, we can take off the prayer list, Melissa Robinson, uh, Larry Smith, Gail Armstrong, Patricia McCullough, Carolyn Leonard, Ralph Deason, La uh, Lorenzo Calvin, Frank Williams, Jerry New, Brenda Welch, Vince Heath, James McClammy, Mary Johnson, Ava Anderson, Rex Shows, Barry Hall, Maury Coven, Mary Brown, Glenn Wilson, Clifford and Versa Higdon, Bobby Johnson, Jesse Hagburn, Bill Coker, uh, Galen and Linda Grigger, Griggs, uh, Jerry Chandler, Robert Smith, Joni Salter, Judy Anderson, Noah Gibson, Rebecca Gorham, Clinton Morris, 
and it should be Joyce Bradley, not Brantley, but Bradley, Joyce Bradley, uh, Darlene Campbell, Darlene Campbell, Richard uh, Leoto, uh, Bill Bender, uh, Taylor Crawley, Donnie Waters, uh, Valerie Smith, E.J. Waters, Shirley Adams, uh, Jessica Spears, Sarah Tolan, uh, Betty Brantley, William Pate, uh, Van Sims, Eddie Braxton, Aaron Odom, Bill Pate, Mallory Holder, Deborah Hoddard, Pete Hicks, Randy Williams, William, and it should be Cater, C-A-T-E-R, Cater, William Cater, and Betty Booker. And then the names that, that I have that we want to add, uh, Dot Campbell is in the hospital uh, with some kidney stones, and so we want to especially remember Dot this morning uh, here, here in Evergreen. Uh, Jimmy McKin McKinney uh, also with, with a brain tumor. And then a name I want you to add, if you would, Nina, N-I-N-A, Nina Fisher. She's uh, one of the members at church in Southside in Greenville, and yesterday she had brain surgery. They were coming back this week from vacation, and uh, they were flying into Montgomery. And as they, as they got into Montgomery, when she got ready to leave the plane, she collapsed, and they rushed her to uh, Jackson, did some scans, and they, and they found the, the, the tumor. Uh, did surgery yesterday. Uh, I have not heard from him this morning, but it was about 4.45, 3.45 when they started that surgery yesterday evening. It was supposed to be about a six to seven hour surgery. But the good news is, is that he, he texted me late uh, yesterday evening and said that the doctor had, had called him uh, and was headed into an emergency surgery, but that hers had only lasted four hours. So I'm, I'm taking that. That was a good sign. And, and uh, we still haven't... Uh, he still hasn't had an opportunity to talk to the doctor because of that emergency surgery. So we're praying for good results today when he does have an opportunity to sit down with the doctor. But just especially remember Nina Fisher, Nina and Steve Fisher uh, in your prayers and uh, uh, for, for just continued good results for, for them right there. All right, if you would open your Bibles today, we return to the book of Revelation this morning, chapter 6. And I want to read these verses of Scripture today. There, there are several of them, 17 verses today. But, but I think it's important to hear the Word of God. Amen? And so I'm going to take the time to read them, and then we'll come back and we'll study and them together and bring the message from them uh, in a little bit. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked and behold a black horse. and He who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren 
who would be killed as they were was completed. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then a sky, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Would you bow together with me as I lead us in prayer today? Heavenly Father, we do come today thankful for the opportunity to read the Word of God. We come not only thankful for the opportunity to read the Word, but we come thankful that we have the Word upon which we can read and study. Lord, today I pray that as the Word of God is studied, as the Word of God is preached in this pulpit this morning, that it will go forth with great power and with great effectiveness. I pray that as the Word of God is preached in Sunday school, that you'll bless the teachers, that you'll anoint them with the power of the Holy Spirit of God so that the truth of God's Word might always remain and be proclaimed as you've given us that responsibility. Father, I come today to pray for these that are on our prayer list. Lord, I thank you that names have been removed from the list. We thank you that people are doing better. But then, Lord, there are continued names that are on this list that have great needs today, and we pray for them. We pray especially, Father, for those that are struggling with such health issues, such pain that they're dealing with and going through, and they're searching for ways and for answers to have relief. And God, we pray for you today to especially work on their behalf. Lord, I especially pray for Miss Betty Booker today and all the discomfort and pain that she's enduring, for doctor's appointments that will be coming this week. I pray, Father, for answers. I pray for for relief for her. I know, Father, that you're capable. And God, as humbly as I know how, I ask that you would provide for her. So many more that are on this list today, Lord, like her, that have such great needs in their life. I pray for the fishers today, Lord, And I pray for the results of that report with the doctor this morning at some point. God, I just ask for good news. I believe you've given us a sign that surgery wasn't as long as he thought, wasn't as complicated as he thought. And Lord, I believe that's an answer to prayer. Your people pray. And I just pray now for continued needs that exist in that family. I pray, Lord, for others that are in the hospital on this list, part of our fellowship, with struggles for health needs. I pray for your blessings to be upon them. Lord, you've instructed us to intercede on behalf of one another. Today we come doing that on behalf of all these names that are represented on this prayer list. Now, Lord, as we move into this time of worship, may our hearts be lifted in praise to you. Lord, we have so many reasons to sing. If there's ever a group of people who have a reason to sing, Christian people are those people. And so, Lord, as we lift our voices today, may we sing out of hearts overflowing with praise to the God who means so much and has done so much for us all. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, open your Bibles uh, today to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation, the sixth chapter, and we're going to be studying together Today in the message, these verses 1 through 17 of this chapter. I want to speak to you today on this subject, a first alert storm forecast. Next Sunday, when we move into the seventh chapter, the message will be entitled, In the Eye of the Storm. So you can gather from the title of today's message and next Sunday's message, 
that we are entering into a section of our study of the book of Revelation that predicts a terrible storm is coming to the earth. We're going to study a little bit about that as we study this chapter today. Before I dive into the chapter, I want to do a little bit of review with you since we've been out of our study of Revelation for a month. I want to just refresh your mind as to where we are in our study of the book. Remember, we've given the overall theme of this book the title, The Captain. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of our soul and salvation, who one of these days is going to come and will implement various events that will take place on the earth. Now, we have divided the book into three sections. Our outline for the book came from the book itself, from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. We've studied the first chapter, which if you'll remember was the captain certified. John gets a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorified, resurrected, victorious Son of God. He is the certified Jesus of the book. And then we moved into chapters 2 and 3. Those chapters we talked about the captain communicating. He's talking to his churches. He's communicating to the churches. And those seven churches in Asia Minor become a representation of churches today. You can go anywhere you want across America and the world and you'll find cold churches. You'll find liberal churches. You'll find churches that have departed from the things of God all predicted by John in this vision that he saw. And then we moved into the fourth chapter about a month ago and we studied in those two chapters four and five and those chapters deal with the Lord's coming, the captain's coming. Now this is the longest section in the book of Revelation. It covers chapter four and it goes all the way to chapter 22. Remember, I I divided this section into four different sections and that's where we are in our study. The first section had to do with the rapture, remember. Chapter 4 and 5. The Lord Jesus Christ coming in the air, not all the way to the earth, but in the air, in rapture, catching up His church out of this world and taking it into glory. And we studied in those two chapters some of the things that will happen or be happening in heaven. Now, the second division of these chapters, uh, 4 through 22, begin in chapter 6, and they go all the way through to chapter 19. And this is the section called the retribution, or the judgment of God. These are judgment chapters in the Bible. These are chapters that describe what's going to happen on the earth one of these days when the church is raptured up and God begins to deal with those who are left. That's the section we're in now. When we come to chapter 20, that's the reign, the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. In chapter 19, He comes back on a white horse. He touches down on the earth. He is victorious in His reign and He establishes a thousand year reign on the earth in chapter 20. And then in chapters 21 and 22, that's the renewing. The renewing, a new heaven, a new earth. The new Jerusalem, the holy city coming down from God out of heaven. And boy, we're going to talk about some heavenly things when we get to those chapters in the months to come. That's the division. We're in that second section, 6 through 19, judgment as it comes upon the earth. Now that's the reason I've entitled the message today, A First Alert Storm Forecast. You will notice in chapter 6 and verse 1 that this chapter says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. The Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ that we saw back in chapter 4 when John sees this scroll and he wonders who is it who is worthy to be able to open this seven sealed scroll and he sees the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the seals are about to be broken. The scroll is about to be opened. And you will notice that in verse 1 he says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, With a voice like what? A voice like thunder. Thunder is always an indication of what? A storm is on the way. 
you know, uh, the only problem with storm forecasts is sometimes we don't pay any attention to them. You ever notice that? In fact, sometimes WFSFA can give you a very severe weather alert day and it doesn't turn out to be a severe weather alert day. And then the next time they give it, you just sort of shuff it off and say, well, it wasn't alert day last time, it won't be this time. That's the problem a lot of times with warnings. You know, Monday was uh, Memorial Day and the offices were closed at Southside and so Peggy and I went out on the water. We went fishing. And you know what? Uh, it, the storms came in some that morning and I'd wanted to go bad. I'd wanted to take her. It's one of the things we like to do. Just get all out there by yourself and, and, and pull in some fish. And so she said about 12, I think if we go on and go now, we can get ahead of what might be coming this afternoon. And so we did. And we got there. And we caught some fish. But it wasn't until way on later in the afternoon we found that sweet spot. You know what I'm talking about? Them big old boys right there, Gerald. And, and, and uh, you know, I got me a few of them, and then I heard that rumbling, you know. And I, uh, Peggy said, don't you think we better go? I said, no, let's wait just one little minute, you know. And we got another one. And, and, and then I'd hear that rumbling. And finally, I said, I do think we better go. And she said, I agree with you. She had already pulled it up on her app. She said, that thing's got lightning in it. And so, you know what? We heeded the warning signs, and we went to the bank. We loaded the boat. And as we were going up the hill away from the lake, guess what? The storm came. I'm talking about nickel-sized hail. Now, aren't I glad I wasn't in that boat out there on that lake when that came, huh? You see, we had heeded the warning, and because we heeded the warning, we were in a place of safety when the storm came. I'm just trying to say to you this morning, and before we finish these chapters 6 through 19 in the next months, you're going to realize a real storm is on the way, and God is giving His first alert storm forecast in chapter 6 and the chapters that follow, and the important thing is, hey folks, we need to war, we need to heed the warning. Amen? We need to heed the warning. We need to make the preparations and we need to do the things that God desires for us to do. A storm is coming one of these days. In fact, the key idea that God gave me this week was simply this. God's storm of judgment is coming. You better prepare. You better prepare. It is coming and we can begin to hear the rumbling of the thunder we can begin to hear, see the flashing of the lightning as the storm approaches. Now, what we're going to discover as we study these next chapters 6 through 19 is that this storm begins with seven seals that are about to be broken. These seals are going to be broken and these are seals of judgment. It's judgment that's going to fall upon the earth. When we get to the seventh seal, that seventh seal is going to open up seven trumpets of judgment. And they're going to blow quickly and, 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 and judgment is going to fall upon the earth. And then when the seventh trumpet blows, it's going to open up seven bowls of judgment. And the thing is, these things get more intense. They get worse the further along they go. This is just the start of it this morning, ladies and gentlemen. There, there'll, there'll be seven seals of judgment. And, and as, as we get to that seventh seal, you would think we're going to drop right on into you know, or, or to, to the uh, trumpets, but between six and seven, there's an interlude. There's a pause. That's chapter seven. And I'll talk about that. That's why I call it in the eye of the storm. See, the first part of the storm's passed over. We're now in the eye of it then, but there's more to come. And we'll talk about that in chapter 7. And then in chapter 8, we've got those trumpet judgments. And at the end of chapter 9, as we go into chapter 10, there's another pause in the action. And then the bold judgments are poured out in chapter uh, 11 all the way to chapter 19, beginning, ending with the battle of Armageddon and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. So let's start looking at these judgments of God. Now you might be saying, well preacher, why would God do this? Why would God have a period of time called great tribulation where He would allow such unbelievable judgment to be poured out on the earth? 
And I want to give you two reasons. Let me just give you two reasons this morning. I don't think I put them in your notes, but I want to give them to you. Here they are. Here are the reasons for this period called Great Tribulation mentioned in the Bible or the day of God's wrath that's often referred to. Number one is the conversion of Israel. The conversion of the nation of Israel. The conversion of the Jew. Now, I don't have time this morning, but Daniel chapter 9 tells us that there will be a, a, a week, a period, of, and weeks there refer to years, and he says seven weeks, but it's seven years, and maybe a little later on we'll do Daniel. How about that? We'll just go through Daniel, all right? That's, a, that's always a good follow-up from Revelation, do Daniel. But he, he tells us in chapter 9 that God is going to deal with the nation of Israel. They're His chosen people, the Jewish people, God's chosen nation, the nation of Israel. And God's going to give them one more opportunity. He's going to give them one more chance to come to, to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. So that, that's one reason, the conversion of Israel. The second reason is the condemnation of a lost world. The condemnation of a lost world. Oftentimes people say, I don't, I don't understand, preacher, why God doesn't judge this world. Well, just give Him time. He is going to judge this world. Nothing gets by God. Judgment is going to come. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Brother, you better put it under the blood of Jesus if you don't want it found out. And if you don't want it dealt with, you better let Jesus deal with it at the cross of Calvary. Now you say, well, well, preacher, I just don't understand how God could do something like this. Does God, does, does He desire to punish people? Does He want to punish people? And the obvious answer to that is no. God doesn't want to punish people. God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. I tell people that God doesn't send people to hell. People send people to hell. That, that, your decision decides whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell. God doesn't desire that. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, The Lord isn't slack concerning promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What does that verse say? God doesn't desire to punish anybody. In fact, God has made provision whereby people don't have to be punished and that provision is His Son. Paul said it in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. He said, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, even Jesus Christ, who desires that all men might be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God doesn't want to punish people. God wants them to come to the truth and God wants them to be saved and spared from wrath that is to come. But God will judge sin, and that judgment is coming, and that's why chapter 6 says to us, you need to be prepared. So let's dive into these verses this morning. I've divided this chapter into three sections. Three sections, and let's walk down through them today as we notice this first alert storm forecast. In verses 1 through 8, I want you to notice, and notice my words carefully, I want you to notice these verses deal with the what? The beginning of God's wrath. It's just the start. This isn't the start and the end. It's just the start. And what happens in these verses is that John looks, he sees the Lamb of God as he begins to open the seals of this book and the judgment of God begins to be poured out upon the earth. Now, it comes in the form of riders. Riders on horses are coming forth. And you might think, well, what's the deal with the horses? In this day of fast cars and jet planes, why horses? Well, in Bible days, the horse was held in greatest respect. It was seen as a powerful force of battle. And so John uses what was familiar to him to describe the things that are about to come and the riders on the horses. And so here they come. Let's look at them. Let's read these verses again. And I want you to notice these four horses and I've given some titles to them. I want you to notice in verse 2 that we have the white horse of domination. The white horse of domination. Verse 2. 
John said, I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The white horse of domination. White in the, in the Bible is a symbol of victory. It is a symbol uh, uh, of power. And so here we have a rider coming on a horse, and he is very powerful. He has a great deal of influence and authority. Now, listen carefully. Do not confuse this rider in Revelation 6, 2 with the rider in Revelation 19, 11. In Revelation 19, 11, there is another rider that comes on a white horse. I'll go ahead and tell you, that's Jesus Christ. He's coming. He's going to return. And He returns in Revelation 19, 11. This is not Him in Revelation 6, 2. This is an imposter. This is, I believe, the Antichrist, the one who will come on the scene after the rapture of the church. Now just think about it. The church is raptured. We have millions of people, literally millions that have disappeared from the earth. Could you imagine the confusion that that's going to cause? Could you imagine the chaos that is going to erupt in our world as a result of that? Could you imagine, just thinking of the world we live in, could you imagine the newscast that will be going on during that time trying to figure all this out and what's happened? And guess what? The world will be ripe at that point as it's ever been for a leader who's got the answers to come on the scene and to take over. And notice something about him. Notice something about this, this antichrist, this, this false Christ that will come on the scene. You'll notice in verse 1, he says, he who sat on it, this white horse, had a what? He had a boat. Now, I'm old country boy. I'm old hunting preacher. That, that, my, one of my granddaughters calls me hunting preacher. That's what she calls me. Well, I am that. Well, notice what's not mentioned in this text. He's got a bow, but he ain't got no ammunition. You notice that? It doesn't say a bow and what? Arrows. He's just got a bow. But you know what that tells me? That tells me he's going to take over without ever having to fire a shot. He's going to take over not on the basis of his power and his military might, but on the basis of his diplomacy and the fact that he'll be able to come on the scene and offer the world peace. In fact, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3, he'll come saying peace and safety, but it'll be his own destruction. There'll be no peace and safety. And we'll see that as we continue to study. So, so here is the Antichrist as he rises on the scene after the rapture of the church and as the church, as the world begins to extend its life in a world of tribulation. So there's the white horse of domination. Secondly, there's a red horse that comes on the scene. You notice in verse 3, he says, When he opened the second seal, he heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take what? To take peace from the earth. And the people shall kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. This is what I call the red horse of division. The white horse, the Antichrist, comes on the scene. He promises peace. And there will be a period of peace. We'll talk about it in weeks to come. A period of peace will come on the earth. But in the middle of this, three and a, this seven year period, he's going to break that peace treaty with Israel. He's going to go into the temple that he allows them to rebuild and reconstruct in Jerusalem. And he's going to put himself in there and he's going to declare that the whole world bow down and worship him as God. Hey, what has Satan always wanted to be, ladies and gentlemen? God. What has he always wanted to have? God's place. And man, he's going to think with this false Christ that he's going to be able to take it all over and control it all. I just got news for him. He ain't met Jesus fully yet, ladies and gentlemen, but one of these days he will. So you've got this red horse of division. There is no peace. Notice, our world, listen, our world has never been riper than it is right now 
for these kinds of conditions. I mean, already brothers killing brothers. Already we got bloodshed in the streets. You can just have a little power outage in America, ladies and gentlemen, and Sheriff Emma, not right. We got chaos in America because of it, right? Because we just, our morals have gone. Our, our consciousness has been seared with a hot iron because people won't stand for the truth any longer. So you've got the red horse of division. And then there's the black horse. Notice that in verse uh, 5 and following. When I opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come and see. I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. You see, this is a black horse of depression. These days are going to get worse the further they go. It's going to get difficult. In fact, you'll notice, famine will be a part. Starvation will be a part of what happens during these days of tribulation. And you notice he, he, he had scales. And the scales are for measuring food. Notice that. And, and notice he says, a quart of wheat for a denarius. A denarius was a day's wage, remember? And then three quarts of barley for a denarius. Now, let, let, me, let me put this in its perspective. Normally, a day's wage would buy a man enough food to feed his family. That was equated right here, you, you, you see, a quart. Normally, a denarius in Bible days would buy you about eight to ten quarts. And of the barley, about 24 to 30 quarts. So you see what's happening? You, you just got a day's wage is going to buy a family enough food to feed one. To feed one. That's the picture here. So you got mass starvation. You got famine that will come during this particular time. Of, of, of tribulation. So you've got the white horse of domination, the Antichrist. And, and you've got the, the red horse of division. You've got the black horse of depression. By the way, uh, in socialist countries, it's what America better wake up and understand. In socialist countries, here's what you got. You got those who have getting more and more and those who ain't getting less and less. And I'm just telling you, we better wake up in America when it comes to that. You, you notice right here in this verse for move. You know, I could just preach on the four horses. Y'all do understand that. I could just do that. I, I got a bunch more to go here. But, but you notice it says, a quart of wheat, three quarts of barley, but don't harm what? Don't harm the oil and the water. Why? In other words, the luxuries, let's leave those things alone. You know who's going to have those too, don't you? And, and in socialist countries, it's the governmental bureaucrats who control the price line of everything and a free market for everything is gone out that have everything and control everything. And that's the way it'll be during these days of tribulation. And then of course you, you, you wind up this whole story with the pale horse of destruction. Verse 7 and 8, He opens the fourth seal. He hears the voice that says, Come and see. Verse 8, I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed him. The grave and death followed him. And he had power to, to over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. And you talk about judgment. Don't think God isn't going to judge the world. Like, you know, here's your picture, and by the way, it's just what? The beginning of God's wrath. So what's a pale horse? It's destruction. It's death. A quarter of the earth. Let me, let me put it in perspective. About seven and a half billion people live in the world today. If it were to happen today, and everybody stayed, 1.9 billion would die. 1.9 billion would die. Either by the sword, or by hunger, or by wild beast, as the text says. These are the days of God's judgment that falls upon the earth. And so there's the beginning of God's wrath in verses 1 through 8. These riders that come forth indicating things that are going to happen during this time. Secondly, in verses 9 through 11, I want you to notice the burden of God's witnesses. The burden of God's witnesses. 
We'll talk about them a little more next Sunday. In verse 9 it says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they have. So here are people who have been martyred during this period of time. And I'll talk to you about that next week. There, there are going to be some people who will be saved during this period of time. I, I just told you, God's going to give Israel an opportunity to be saved. In fact, we'll talk about it next week. God's going to have during these seven years 144 missionaries. Jewish missionaries. I know they're Jewish because it describes the tribe from which they came in the text next Sunday. And we'll talk about that. And they're going to hit the world. He'll have two witnesses that will be undestructible that he decides for them to be destroyed. And then he's going to raise them up. I mean, our God's got power, ladies and gentlemen. Don't ever deny when you drop your knees and pray to God that you're praying to some puny God. Oh, no. You're praying to a powerful, almighty, omnipotent God that can move heaven and earth with the prayers of His people. And so here you have these martyrs. Their blood is at the altar like the blood of the animal sacrifices were. And I want you to notice two quick things. I want you to notice, first of all, why they died. And then what they cried. I want you to notice why they died. You notice the text tells us in verse 9 that they died for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. They died because during this time period they took a stand for the word of God. Could I tell you today that God's word is under attack? Could I tell you that? In fact, don't be lulled by everything that's going on in America and thinking that all is well and that everybody just welcomes the Word of God. They don't. In fact, I'm going to tell you there are people this morning who would like to destroy the Word of God. They'd like to do away with the Word of God. There are people today who would not only like to destroy it, they, they like to just dilute it. You know, let's just dilute it. Let's take the scissors of reason and clip the wings of revelation. That's what some people would like to do in the world in which we live. Some would like to destroy it. Some just want to dilute it. And some just flat out deny it, that it's not the Word of God. You want to get in a row, brother. You just take you a good stand, good old conservative stand. I started to say Baptist, but I can't do that no more. You just take you a good old conservative stand, ladies and gentlemen, for the Word of God, and you'll row people up. I got news for you though. Long as this preacher stands in this pulpit, the Word of God will be declared with uncompromising force and power by the Holy Spirit of God. It's the only book we got to stand on, ladies and gentlemen. And so here it is. They stand for the Word of God. They also stand for the Son of God. They held the testimony that they had that Jesus was the Savior and the Messiah. You want to upset folks, you just talk about Jesus a little bit. Yeah, you won't upset anybody if you talk about God because that could be Mohammed, that could be whoever. Oh, but let, get down there and talk about Jesus a little bit. Get down there and talk about the Son of God. Get down there and talk about the Savior of the world. And that's where you upset folks. But I got news for you. Some need to be upset because they're going to get hell wide open if they don't come under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here they are. That, that, that's why they died. They died for their testimony that they held of Jesus and their stand for the Word of God. But notice what they cried. Notice they cried out. And it seems like a strange cry to us. Verse 10 says, They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And, and that phrase you'll see several those who dwell on the earth. And it refers to, to those who live during this time period. Then you'll notice it says white robes were given to them and it was said to them that they should rest a little while. In other words, until this all comes to a conclusion. But notice what they cried. They cried, How long, O Lord, until you judge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now it sounds like a strange cry, doesn't it? Almost sounds like sour grapes kind of thing. Almost sounds like, you know, uh, somebody that's got whooped and they're complaining because they did. That's not it. Listen, this isn't a 
a cry for personal vindication. This is a cry for divine justification. There it is. That's what it is. It's not personal for them. It's that God, how long? And notice it. Notice they don't say how long. How long? If you judge, they say how long before you judge, because judgment is going to come. They cry out for divine justification on the earth. So you have the burden of God's witnesses. You have the beginning of God's wrath. And the last thing in verses 12 through 17 is the bewilderment of God's world. Boy, you talk about a world in trouble. Just think about it. While God's people are rejoicing with joy in heaven, earthly people are going through agony on earth. While there's tranquility and glory, there's trouble on the ground. And I want you to notice two quick things before I draw some application for us today. I want you to notice, first of all, a world in turmoil. If you've ever seen a world in turmoil, here it is. Notice verse 12. It says, When I looked, and, and, and when he opened the, the sixth seal, there was a great what? Earthquake. It isn't the last one. And they grow in intensity. There's one here in chapter 6. There's another one coming. And there's a final one coming before Jesus returns. And they all grow. And you notice there was an earthquake. And watch. The sun became black. The moon became blood. The stars fell from the earth like ripe figs in a wind. And the sky rolled up like a scroll. It's like God it just pulls the shades down over the sun and the moon. And a world is seen in utter turmoil. I'm telling you, there hasn't been anything like this, even close like this ever. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21, <clears throat> that nothing has ever been like this day is going to be. A world in turmoil. But watch, a world in terror. Look at verse 15. The kings. Oh, now, we've got to the oil and wine holders now. Notice. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man. And what did they do? They hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and in the mountains. You know, I found that interesting. Because I, I was reminded when I read it, immediately when I read it, I was reminded of another time when a man and a woman tried to hide. You remember, don't you? Go all the way back to Genesis where it all started. And Adam and Eve tried to hide. Hey, could they hide? They couldn't hide, could they? They couldn't run. And neither will the mighty men, the great men, or any person for that matter, be able to run and hide. And there'll be terror on the earth. Notice they, they, they run, they hide. And you know, the thing that breaks my heart is they run to the wrong places, don't they? They run to the caves. They run to the hills and to the mountains. The psalmist had it right when he said, I will look unto the hills. And he was talking about beyond them, from which cometh my strength. And in case you didn't understand, he was talking about beyond them. He said, oh, my strength cometh from the Lord. You see, they should have been running where? To God. In fact, before this ever started, amen, they should have been running to God. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. They ran to the wrong place and they also prayed to the wrong person. I mean, you think a rock's going to hear you when you cry out? You think a cave is going to listen to you? You're going to get nothing. But you can get something when you cry out to the living God. So, let's wrap this up with some practical application. What, what should be our responses to this future event that's coming? And I've put three in your notes for you. And I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. But I've but, but I put them there because I think this is what God wants us to do after we have got a little feel for this chapter. First response is what I call a praise response. I mean, when you go and read 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul talks about whom we wait for the Lord from heaven, even Jesus Christ, who will... listen who will deliver us from the wrath to come. Guess what? I got a deliverance ticket out of that stuff right here in Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad you ain't going to have to go through this if you're saved this morning? 
Aren't you glad? You're not going to have to endure this. There's, there, there's a response, a praise response. You won't go through that wrath. Secondly, there's a passion response. Now listen to me carefully. A passion response. 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, and hopefully you begin to understand it, Paul said, knowing therefore, listen, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. See, prophecy is one of the greatest motivations for evangelism in all of the Bible. If you believe this is coming and you've got a friend that's lost, wouldn't you want to try to help them? I mean, we don't need to sit back and say nothing. Or we don't need to be timid or afraid we're going to hurt their feelings. Somebody said, I, 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 don't, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I might, I might, I might mess up. I, well, if, if you hurt their feelings about coming to Jesus, what are you going to do? Send them to hell number two? I mean, they're already going where? Yeah, we don't want to say it. But the truth is, if they don't know Jesus, that's the truth, isn't it? That's the eternal destiny. A passion response. And then finally, a personal response. And a twofold personal response. One for the lost. I mean, if, if there's a lost person here this morning or watching or listening to me, come to Jesus. Man, come to Jesus. Because the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. You say, well, now, preacher, you kind of mentioned somebody might be saved during the tribulation. I did, and I'll talk to you about that next week. And, and, and I, I've had people tell me that. Well, you know, I'll just tell you what. I don't know why I believe all that stuff you're talking about anyway. And if that, I don't know if that rapture is going to occur or not. So I'm just going to wait. And if it does occur, then I'll have a chance then. You know what, I, you know what my response is? When you won't come to Jesus now when it's easy, how, what makes you believe you'll come to Jesus then when you're going to have to die for it? When you're going to have to die for it? We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. So a personal response. Now is your day. Now is your opportunity. And then for the say, that's for you and me. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 28, says that we should abide in Him so that when He appears, listen, we'll have confidence in Him and not be ashamed of His coming. See, I believe there are going to be some Christian folks who are going to be ashamed. I do. I don't think. I, I believe there are going to be some Christian folks who are not going to be ready when this event begins to come. They get raptured up to meet the Lord in the air. We need to be ready. God's storm of judgment is coming. Be prepared. I have a book in my study by Dr. Billy Graham. It's entitled, The Approaching Hoofbeats. He wrote that book on Revelation many years ago. After he wrote that book, he was interviewed by a news person who talked to him about the book and said, Now, Dr. Gray, do you really believe that? He said, I absolutely do. In fact, he said, I believe that the sound of the hoofbeats are getting louder and louder. And I agree today, ladies and gentlemen, with Dr. Gray. The sound of the hoofbeats are getting louder and louder and louder. And the message of Revelation 6 to us today is, accept Jesus now and live for Jesus until then. Amen? Amen. That's the message. Accept Jesus now and live for Jesus until then. Would you bow together with me in prayer? Father, thank you so much for your word. Because, Lord, even in Your Word, the harder parts of Your Word, You give warning and You show mercy and You give grace. Today, Father, I pray, if there are those who need to make decisions, whether it's a lost person who needs to be saved or a saved person who needs to rededicate their life, begin to serve You faithfully, that today people will respond to the coming day of judgment, one of these days that will begin. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today is 198. Would you turn to that? 198, when you find your place there, if you go ahead and stand with me, we're going to share together our time of invitation. Would you stand? Well, I got into Sunday school time, I guess, a little bit this morning. But, hey, when God's moving, He just moves, isn't it? And... Uh, uh, you know, you just I, I got a preacher that'll just stay too long, I guess. But uh, I love the word. 
I got uh, decisions that I, I want to share with you. Kay and Clifford Evans, we we known them, and, and he, he said we coming home, and and uh, they 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 want to join uh, Ollie Branch by transfer of letter from Evergreen Baptist Church. Uh, those who welcome them, accept them, all favor by saying aye. 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 Amen. Look at them good eyes right there. And uh, I, I told Kay, I said, who would ever thunk? That when we was growing up right here, that I'd be her pastor. Who in the world? You know, how about that? Isn't that something? And God just has a way of doing things that we don't even think about. Isn't that right? I'm going to let y'all go back to the back, okay? And let our folks come by and just express love and prayer support. Right. Amen. Amen. Uh, a, a, a prayer request from uh, one of our listeners uh, that, that watches us every Sunday, uh, Deanna and Howie Gillis. Uh, from Milton, Florida. I, I was their pastor when Peggy and I were, were at, at uh, Pine Terrace uh, in, uh, in Milton, and, and they watch us faithfully every week. Mark, uh, Mike Luther, you know, that passed away recently, was on our prayer list. They, these are all family members. Uh, Howie has a knee replacement uh, Thursday in Milton, and they wanted us to pray for him. Isn't that something? Uh, people believe in the prayers that they're hearing and seeing and reports about watching uh, on Facebook. And then also, baby Mia uh, is five pounds and one ounce. How about that? Isn't that something? And started out with just uh, just, just tiny, tiny. So, so God, God's doing good things in their life. We're thankful uh, for that. Hey, I hope you have a good day today. And uh, God bless you. Keep praying for me as we go through this. But I'm trying to make it as simple as I know how and bring some personal application to it as well as we walk our way through promise. I know chapter 6 isn't as exciting as chapter 4 and 5, but hey, there, there ought to be that passion response, that praise response, and that personal response that comes as a result of it all. Let's bow together as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dalton, would you dismiss us please today? Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we've been here to hear your word. Father, we just thank you so much for your love. Father, we just have prayers just one after another for the folks on our prayer list and for these that have just been mentioned, for the gentleman that has for the knee replacement coming up. Father, we just pray that you'll be with the surgeons. And Father, we just uh, are so proud that uh, Pete Hicks has just gone through one of those and is recovering well. Father, we just thank you for the way that you love us and the way you take care of us and the way that you guide us. And Father, we just pray now that each and every one of us, <clears throat> as we leave this place, will turn our eyes to Jesus and follow him and show others that Jesus be seen through us as we walk daily. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.